Hey, good people. So this week we are going to be uh, talking about human rights and social justice. Now, this chapter um, is just going to be introducing some concepts to us. This is actually a topic that we get into a lot more in another class um, that if you continue in the social work program that you would have the opportunity to take, and that would be the course of social welfare. Um, but for this chapter for this class, we're going to be looking at, like I said, just some introductory information just to get us familiar with the um, the the process and get us familiar with the the rights, the responsibilities of not only our, our clients, consumers and patients, but also what you the helping professional what the services services, excuse me, that you are obligated to provide, um, because it's very important that we understand the relevance of human rights and social justice, especially when it comes down to us, the helping professional advocating and working on behalf of our client, consumer and patient. So let's go ahead and get started. The very first place we're going to get started is just talking about what human rights is. Um, and our book uh, gives us a great definition of human rights as it reviews it from the perspective of the uh, United Nations. And um, when we're talking about, I'm sorry, before I get to that, um, perspective from the United Nations. Let me just talk a little bit more about what human rights is. Human rights uh, that our book talks about identifies that there are three specific um, three specific areas, I guess we could say, that we ad that we address when we're talking about human rights and civil rights, and that would be human rights, civil rights, and citizens' rights. Now, as we go down and we begin to look at um, what the United Nation has said about the issue of human rights. The United Nation defines human rights, as you see on your screen, as being inherent and fundamental freedoms. Now, I'm just gonna encourage you to think about what does that mean? How are you understanding that from your perspective? Um, because it's very important that we kind of begin the, the discussion of human rights and social justice from where we are in order that we get an understanding about where we uh, would like to see ourselves grow into. Um, one of the things that you may see when you're reading through this chapter is that it, it indicates in our book, uh, and I'm just going to read this verbatim, because these basic human rights are inherent, human rights cannot be granted, nor can they be taken away. They can only be violated. So again, when we're thinking about the whole idea of human rights, um, and the definition that is provided from the United Nations, I really want you to think about what is your understanding of the definition and how you view the, the, the concept of human rights, how you define that for yourselves. So as we continue and just again, kind of laying the foundation of human rights, um, the book kind of breaks things down for us and defines human rights kind of in this uh, collective way and looking at three specific categories. We have civil and political, we have, excuse me, we have social and economic, um, and then we have our uh, collective rights. So when we're first talking about our civil and our political rights, one of the things that we know is that our civil and political rights um, are looking at those specific rights that we have um, that uh, restrict the rule of the government um, in regards to how they impact or influence uh, the way that we decide um, how we want to participate from a political perspective. The second generation looks at our social, cultural, and economic perspective. And again, when we're talking about human rights, we're examining what is, what is fair and just when we talk about people having the access to and the opportunity to uh, live according to a standard that ensures their health and their well-being. The third generation or the third uh, category of rights that our book talks about is going to be our collective rights. And when we talk about the collective rights, we're looking at this from uh, kind of a structural functional perspective. And we'll get into that a little bit later. When we're looking at how everything is starting to function and work together, not just from a personal perspective, but we look at it from a national perspective and a global perspective. As we continue on talking about uh, human rights, we do get into, um, or the book is into, again, giving us the foundation of a couple of different things. We look at civil rights, citizens' rights, and civil liberties. 
So when we're going back and we're talking about civil rights and citizens' rights, these are things that we're talking about, and actually civil liberties as well. When we're looking at these issues, we're looking at um, first identifying what, um, what may be oppressing, what elements, what behaviors, what issues may be creating a, uh, a, a space of oppression uh, from a social perspective for a specific group of people. Um, you know, looking at how are we marginalizing or how people are being marginalized based on social functioning. So as we, again, explore this a little bit deeper, we look at civil rights and civil liberties and we can see how they kind of join in together. Are civil rights looking at how we address um, the issues of discrimination and oppression um, with marginalized populations. Our civil liberties are looking at, again, the constitutional um, rights that are given to us under our constitution. And when we put all these together, this is where we, we begin to see um, how, we, uh, how we as helping professionals are working towards creating a sense of unity, a sense of harmony, a sense of freedom um, for all of our clients, consumers, and patients. But of course, when we're talking about it from a very uh, broad perspective, we break things down a little bit more and we look at things, again, from this social um, perspective and the, and the way society is functioning around these issues or around certain issues. So one of the things that we look at when we're talking about um, you know, social justice and human rights is this right to social welfare. Now, I, I don't want you to mistake this good people. When we talk about social welfare, we are not speaking about government assistance. When we talk about social welfare, we are talking about having uh, people having the access and equal opportunity to uh, improve themselves or to have resources available that are going to address education, employment, health, and any other resource that they may need in order to uh, function freely and to be and to feel as though that they are receiving the benefits equally um, as others may be. So when we're talking about social welfare, it's not looking at government assistance, but how are we within society functioning and providing opportunities across the board for everyone, equal opportunities, for an equal outcome, that, that's the key y'all, equal outcome when we talk about education, employment, health, and any other service that may be available or um, that folks may, may be in need of. Now, as we're talking about social justice, we have to, of course, begin with a foundation of, of theory. Um, that's just where we are when we talk about um, social justice, when we talk about political justice, when we're looking at how we as helping professionals work with our clients, consumers, and patients, we have to have an understanding of the direction that we are going to be coming from, but also the direction that we may need to address. So our book kind of gets us into looking at three specific um, classifications of social justice theory. Um, we look at uh, liberal libertarianism, excuse me, utilitarianism and egalitarianism. So let me go back. Lib libertarianism is all about um, the individual rights, individual liberty, individual freedom um, to pursue what you feel as though um, you are entitled to. Um, it's all focused on individual success, I'll say that. Not so much a collectivistic mindset that I'm gonna help you build, I'm gonna help build you up. Under this concept of libertarianism, um, folks who follow this are all about pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And it's not so much a, I'm gonna help you get there, but you get there based on your own merit. Um, so you see here on the screen, libertarianism, they oppose the idea of the welfare system. Now, when we talk about this welfare system, we're looking at it as, in terms of government assistance and also um, opposing affirmative action. When we get to the second theory, utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is saying, okay, well, we need to look at this um, from the notion of what is working for the greatest good and for the greatest number. Um, so they kind of take things from the perspective of some people have, 
some people don't have, and some people have don't don't have enough, and some people have too much. So when we think about this utilitarianism, we're looking at this again from this mindset almost of social Darwinism. And we'll get into that a little bit later uh, in the chapter. The third uh, theory of social justice is egalitarianism. Now, this uh, this theory, the egalitarianism, um, is all about uh, looking at justice being fair, looking at equality uh, for all, looking at equal access to resources, equal access um, to services, looking at how can we make sure that things are moving in a way that is going to be successful, that is going to uh, allow for everyone to reach this place of feeling like a whole person. Okay, the, the, the long and short of it is, let me get to this last one. We talk about social work and social justice. Our job as helping professionals, um, when we're working with our client consumer patient, our primary focus is always going to be to empower the client consumer patient. And in this instance, when we're talking about social justice, that empowerment may, may come in, or I should say our client consumer patient may result in being um, segments of our society, segments in our community, where we are empowering folks to look at and examine the equity and services, equity in, um, in employment and to challenge that and to, to uh, advocate for some type of social change, whether that, whether that be a societal change or it be a policy change. But it's all about empowering people to get to this place um, where they feel as though that they are a whole person. Now, as we get into talking about um, human rights and social justice, we get into the issue of recognizing the isms. When we talk about recognizing our isms, um, we have to acknowledge. We have to acknowledge good people. I know some folks are gonna shy away from it, but we have to acknowledge that we all have our group of those people. Whomever those people may be, we all have our group. So, um, and when, when I talk about those people, I mean that there's always someone that we are looking at and that we may be looking down upon or looking at them differently because they don't think like we do. They don't act like we do. They don't dress like we do. So at this point, um, I want to I want to show just some very brief clips of groups of those people, so that you get an an, an idea and an explanation of some of the isms that are addressed in our book. We're going to start with racism, and we go to elitism. We go through to sexism, heterosexism, and we will be a having ageism as well as ableism. So these are just going to be like two to three minute clips for each topic. And again, this is just something introducing the concept or the topic to you, but giving you information for you to think about, again, um, some, of the, some of these topics, some of the isms that we face. I don't believe we're free in America. I think we're haunted by our history of racial inequality burdened by this legacy created by slavery and lynching and segregation. Whether you're born in 2017 or 1930, you are affected by the environment that we have created by being silent. I don't think slavery ended in 1865. I think it evolved. We had mobs of thousands of people gathering in courthouse yards in fields and doing horrific things to people and we haven't done anything to acknowledge that it is american history and for us to recover from that violence from that terrorism we all have to know it and we have to talk about it i think it will compel us to think differently about what we need to do to correct the past to address the past but also how we make a better future That is racism. So we're gonna move on from racism and we are gonna get into elitism. So here we go. Yeah, but we can forget about him. Yeah, it was just one ad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's just one ad. Yeah, boys, they're puny. Mm, puny? Say, let's pretend this brain is a puny little ant. Did that hurt? 
No. Well, how about this one? Are you kidding? <laughs> how about this? You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? So there you go. Elitism. Let's move on. We're going to talk a little bit about um, heterosexism. When I was about 16 years old, I can remember flipping. Uh oh, hold on, good people. Flipping through channels at home during summer vacation looking for a movie to watch on HBO. And how many of you remember Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Oh, yeah, great movie, right? Well, I saw Matthew Broderick on the screen, and so I thought, sweet, Ferris Bueller, I'll watch this. It wasn't Ferris Bueller. And forgive me, Matthew Broderick, I know you've done other movies besides Ferris Bueller, but that's how I remember you. You're Ferris. But you weren't doing Pharisee things at the time. You were doing gay things at the time. <laughs> He's, he was in a movie called Torch Song Trilogy. And Torch Song Trilogy was based on a play about this drag queen who essentially was looking for love, love and respect. That's what the whole film was about. And as I'm watching it, I'm realizing that they're talking about me, not the drag queen part. I'm not shaving my hair for anyone, but the gay part, the finding love and respect, the part about trying to find your place in the world. So as I'm watching this, I see this powerful scene that brought me to tears and it stuck with me for the past 25 years. And it's this quote that the main character Arnold tells his mother as they're fighting about who he is and the life that he lives. There's one thing more, there's just one more thing you better understand. I've taught myself to sew, cook, fix plumbing, build furniture, I can even pat myself on the back when necessary. Also, I don't have to ask anyone for anything. There's nothing I need from anyone except for love and respect. Anyone who can't give me those two things has no place in my life. I remember that scene like it was yesterday. I was 16, I was in tears, I was in the closet, and I'm, I'm looking at these two people, Ferris Bueller and some guy I've never seen before, <laughs> fighting for love. <laughs> when I finally got to a place in my life where I came out and accepted who I was and was really quite happy to tell you the truth, I was happily gay and I guess that's supposed to be right because gay means happy too. I realized that a lot of people weren't as gay as I was, gay being happy, not gay being attracted to the same sex. In fact, I heard that there was a lot of hate and a lot of anger and a lot of frustration and a lot of fear about who I was and the gay lifestyle. Now, I'm sitting here trying to figure out the gay lifestyle, the gay lifestyle. And I keep hearing this word over and over and over again, lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. I've even heard politicians say that the gay lifestyle is a greater threat to civilization than terrorism. That's when I got scared. <laughs> because I'm thinking, if I'm gay and I'm doing something that's going to destroy civilization, I need to figure out what this stuff is and I need to stop doing it right now. <laughs> so I took a look at my life, a hard look at my life, and I saw some things very disturbing. So I'm going to pause that right there when we talk about heterosexism. We'll keep on moving along, y'all. Now we're gonna look at ageism. Again, just introducing these um, different isms to you because I need you to think about what you're thinking about when it comes down to how we define and categorize that group of those people and who, whatever the, your group of those people may be. This is ageism. 
Ageism is a type of discrimination that involves prejudice against people based on their age. Similar to racism and sexism, ageism involves holding negative stereotypes about people of different ages. The term ageism was first used by gerontologist Robert N. Butler to describe the discrimination of older adults. Today, the term is often applied to any type of age-based discrimination, whether it involves prejudice against children, teenagers, adults, or senior citizens. Younger adults may have difficulty finding jobs and receive lower pay due to their perceived lack of experience, while older adults may have problems achieving promotions, finding new work, and changing careers. Stereotypes that contribute to ageism. Researcher Susan Fisk has suggested that stereotypes about older people often relate to how younger people expect them to behave. The first stereotype she described relates to succession. Younger people often assume that older individuals have had their turn and should make way for the younger generations. The second stereotype relates to what Fisk refers to as consumption. Younger people frequently feel that limited resources should be spent on themselves rather than on older adults. Finally, Young people also hold stereotypes about the identity of older adults. Younger people feel that those who are older, then they should act their age and not try to steal the identities of younger people, including things such as speech patterns and manner of dress. Just how common is ageism? Researchers have found that ageism is surprisingly commonplace. In one study published in a 2013 issue of The Gerontologist, Researchers looked at how older people were represented in Facebook groups. They found 84 groups devoted to the topic of older adults, but most of these groups had been created by people in their 20s. Nearly 75% of the groups existed to criticize older people, and nearly 40% advocated banning them from activities such as driving and shopping. Older adults also feel the impact of this discrimination in the workplace. According to the U.S. Equal Opportunity Commission, almost a quarter of all claims filed by workers are related to age-based discrimination. How to Combat Ageism The American Psychological Association suggests that ageism is a serious issue that should be treated the same as sex, race, and disability-based discrimination. So there we go, ageism. The very last one that we're going to look at, you guys, is going to be ableism. Take one. Shutting down ableism with Amani Barber. Look at me. I am the Amani now. Hey. You may have heard of racism and sexism, but unfortunately, there are a ton more isms in the world. Today, we're here to talk about ableism. I'm a disability rights activist, Imani Barberin. Let's define it. Ableism is the societal, institutional, and interpersonal discrimination of disabled people. And here are some hot takes about ableism. My hot take on ableism is that I don't get a hot take on ableism because I am able-bodied. So, Imani is going to have a couple hot takes. Ooh, I'm so excited. My first hot take is that if you weren't so afraid of disability, you would vaccinate your kids. Second, disabled people are not a litmus test for how well your life is doing by comparison. And third, disabled people don't overcome their disability, they overcome your bias. Ableism is so strange. Disabled people are not the weirdest part about disability, able people are. So here are a couple personal stories about our experiences with ableism. When I was a kid, I struggled with walking. My Achilles tendons weren't long enough to support walking on both of my feet. So I spent the first year of my life in specialty boots for medical reasons. As a result, I have a chronic tendonitis in one of my feet and I'm on crutches quite a bit. And every single time I'm on crutches, ableism jumps out. We gotta do better. One time when I was in home economics class, my teacher wouldn't let me participate because she said my crutches made me dirty. What? Yeah, my mom was not pleased, and that woman, I don't know if she works there anymore. It's what she deserves. Oh, absolutely, I think so. I, I would hit her with a crutch, but I would get sued. <laughs> <laughs> so, second, second, I was walking down the street in New York City, 
and a woman kissed me on the mouth when I was 11 years old and then burst into tears and walked away. <coughs> um, what? <laughs> sorry, I can't. Yeah. Okay, what? I, yeah, I, she was very, I guess, excited to see that I was out and about as a disabled person. I don't know. I'm not that exciting. I was going very slow. It wasn't even an exciting pace. Wow, respect the personal space of disabled folks. Please, this is a huge thing. Don't touch disabled people without their permission. It's not good. So, how can we be better about ableism? Listen to disabled people. You do not have to experience disability in order to identify with disabled people. Don't touch us without our permission. Do not take photos of us without our permission. And please, God, do not do not compare your lives to ours as a way to make yourself feel better. You can feel better about yourself just by going on the internet and clicking on some puppies. You don't need to say we'll be able to do that. It's true. That's all we got for you this week. Don't worry, Blair Imani will be back next week for you. Thank you for being our Woman Crush Wednesday, Imani. Thank you so much. You're I'm so, so excited. Aww. You're so nice. You just and Blair Imani is amazing. And she can walk in a straight line. <laughs> she can make that joke. I can't make that joke. You can't make that joke if you're able bodied. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And remember. All right, good people. So this is, you know, again, we're talking about uh the isms, you know, some of the things that create this boundary uh, or this barrier, maybe I should say, um, in society when we think about um how we interact with folks and how we label people. Um, all of that being a part of, again, fighting to uh, move away from um, issues and areas of oppression and marginalizing, but also making sure that we recognize that the isms do exist. Um, and we have to recognize that from our perspective as helping professionals, what are some of the isms that we're dealing with within ourselves? What are our own biases? So now, as uh, and moving forward now, I want to get to a little bit about some of the theories uh, about social justice. And this is kind of coming from a sociological perspective. The very first one the book talks about is social Darwinism. Um, when we talk about social Darwinism, we're always looking at or um, examining issues based on uh, survival of the fittest. When we look at that from a sociological perspective, as well as when we're talking about social welfare, social welfare, again, not, not talking about government assistance, but the way that we function within society, you know, we have to examine who we're setting up for success, but also who has been labeled and who is um, in this perpetual state of being the one that is not as fit as, or is not able to compete with Again, this whole idea of survival of the fittest. When we get into a little bit more of uh, specific sociological theories, we have our structural functional perspective and social conflict perspective. I'm sorry, social conflict perspective. Our structural functional perspective is all about looking at how um, bits and pieces within society, how it all kind of comes together and it forms a working um, a working organism that makes society function as a whole. So bits and pieces, again, within society. And when we talk about bits and pieces, we're looking at cultural aspects, we're looking at personal aspects, we're looking at industry, looking at systems, looking at business, how all of these things are coming together and how do they function around the idea and the concept of social justice. When we talk about the conflict theory, the conflict theory is all about exploring the inequalities in society. Conflict is not uh, referring to someone getting into an argument with someone, there being physical altercation, but it's all about the battle for power. Where does the inequality lie and who is the one that has the power and what group is fighting for the power? The psychological theory that our book talks about is this concept of, of attribution. Now attribution, again, and this can kind of lead into um, a sociological perspective of symbolic interaction, but with attribution, we're talking about the way that someone makes sense of uh, someone else's behavior based on their ideas, their concepts, their values and their beliefs. So it's how I am looking at someone's behavior, um, how I'm looking at someone's ability to fill in the, bank, in the blank, someone's inability to fill in the blank. But this is all about, this attribution theory is all about, again, looking at 
how I am um, developing my thoughts, which could lead to prejudicial thoughts. And we have to be mindful. Prejudice is the thought, discrimination is the action. So it leads to our beliefs that one group may be less than, one group may be better than. When we get into all of this, and again, still talking about the, the sociological theories or the theories, I should say, in general of social justice, we get into this idea or the concept of blaming the victim. And when we talk about blaming the victim and working in a, in a just world, some of the things that we, that we explore are um, the effects of social justice being dehumanization, victimization, and this concept of learned helplessness. Um, when we're talking about, again, fighting for or looking at um, the injustices in the world, your job as a helping professional is to remove people from this mindset of blaming the victim, meaning that we're looking at, well, you're poor because you don't fill in the blank. Well, you're um, out of work or you're unemployed because you do fill in the blank. We have to move away from that as helping professionals and move into how are we fighting this whole concept of oppression and discrimination. Um, and when we look at that from, again, the helping professionals perspective, and we begin to examine things um, from this ethnocentric viewpoint. Now, when we talk about ethnocentrism, ethnocentrism is all about the perspective of viewing someone and judging someone's culture based on our thoughts, our ideas. So the superior one basing their judgment on what they believe um, and inflicting that and imposing that, I should say, on those who they consider to be inferior. So that all leads to these issues of dehumanization, leads to the issues of victimization, um, and also leads us to this point of, again, part of a sociological perspective, when we talk about symbolic interaction, this labeling theory, when we begin to label people as what we or how we believe they are, or what we believe they are, or how we believe they live, how we believe they function. And when we talk about labeling people and labeling Labeling, labeling them based on a discriminatory way, based on a way that makes them less than um, who we believe we are. We, we begin to create this whole concept of learned helplessness. Now, that doesn't mean I'm forcing you to take the label that I give to you, but when people hear this label over and over and over again, they begin to receive it, they begin to accept it, and they begin to live according to the uh, expectations of the label. So that, uh, that whole concept of learned helplessness is all about, um, for you, the helping professional, getting people in a place where they uh, take back the power that that label took away from them. And I hope that makes sense. One of the things that is in your books, and this is a quote I'm gonna read from your book, in regards to uh, learned helplessness and those that may be living in impoverished situations, the book, uh, this, this quote is, I suggest that among its effects, poverty brings about frequent and intense experiences of uncontrollability. Uncontrollability produces helplessness, which causes the depression, passivity, and defeatism so often associated with poverty. So you see the cycle that when I accept the label and I accept um, the the consequences or the expectations of the label, then I begin to function according to what that label dictates I am and the limitations of that label. That's what learned helplessness is all about. As we continue to go on and we're getting through um, the rest of this chapter, we have to have an understanding that as helping professionals, we are obligated um, based on our uh, code of our code of ethics through the NASW to provide some type of assistance, some type of assistance, and to make sure that the work that we are offering to our clients, consumers, and patients um, are meeting all of their basic human rights. Uh, and that we want to make sure that when we are representing our clients, consumers, and patients, that we do it in a way that there is equity in the services that we provide, but also making sure that we are um, 
treating and recognizing everyone as being uh, important members of our society, contributing members of our society. So one of the things that's important for us to do, like I said before, when we were talking about isms, is we got to recognize the biases that are within ourselves. So one of the things that I'm going to have you all do this week is to uh, complete um, these are just self-paced exams. It's called an implicit exam. And I just want you to choose two of, <clears throat> excuse me, two of the categories on that exam. And all you're gonna do is talk about, you're gonna write about your experiences and the results on the discussion post. All right, good people. So this is social justice um, and human rights, kind of wrapping things up for us. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to contact me by email or my office phone. Also be mindful that in this week's folder, you will have um, the implicit bias test that I'm asking you all to complete along with your discussion post. All right, so I bid you love, peace, and bacon grease. I'll see you when I see ya.